the Herschel and Planck millimeter telescopes have sent back new images of our galaxy's interstellar medium that have many in the astronomical community reeling. It is as if you're riding along and someone pulls a wheel off your bicycle. We are struggling to make sense of this data. It simply does not fit with our previous theories. The previous theories need to be abandoned or severely modified. I think we might need new models. Empirical science requires rigorous adherence to strict rules of process and discovery. Developing new models requires a certain freedom of thought, imagination, even speculation, or going deeply into other disciplines to help spark some new insight. As a musician, it's a lot easier to say uh, that you have experienced the energetic exchange uh, between audience and a performance. And uh, there is definitely no doubt in most musicians' minds that there's some sort of energetic exchange between consciousness and groups. And uh, whether or not you want to uh, boil that down to just uh, brain chemistry or actually some sort of energetic uh, chemistry that's uh, yet to be truly understood, it exists. I love to go dig rocks up. I think it was the coolest thing ever. Just go down to Arkansas and dig some crystals up, clean them up travel around, sell them off. It, it just worked great for what I was wanting to do in life and just have fun, travel. Anything that I really caught my eye I went and I doused over it with this pendulum, and this pendulum was uh, made out of a toroidal transformer, which is a very small kind of donut looking thing. It was just like a piece of electronic junk that my friend had sitting around. He was like, yeah, you can have it. What I come to find was this pendulum was extremely reactive. So I was running around, selling minerals, dragging them around, using my pendulum. And uh, after the day was over, I was gassed and I went back to my camper van. And I just said, hey, uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and just lay down all the cool minerals and gems that I have left. And so I laid down this just big array, just giant array of all these cool colors and different crystals. I like cool old stuff. There's nothing cooler than a 30 million year old gem. So I was just laying them out just for the sheer fun of it. And my pendulum was pulling super crazy hard. And uh, it's really flat and it's nice double terminated. They would call this a tablature crystal. And there's many smaller flat tablatures coming across it. I always knew this was a particularly zingy, we'll just call it zingy crystal. And it was pulling towards this thing at an angle that was not imaginary. So I said, hey, that's wild. That doesn't seem normal. So I took this and I put it inside of the sink basin, inside of the camper van, and I hung the pendulum off of the sink because I felt like there was like 
enough force force going on to hold that angle or something if I just tied it off and just watched it. What ended up happening was I got an oscillation and it was pretty intense. So that was strange. There was no Newtonian explanation. I'm no scientist, but I am a, uh, a tinkerer enough to know that that's not supposed to happen. Actually, around the same time that I was observing this oscillation, I was sitting there smoking my e-cigarette, and some of this vapor ended up making its way into the sink basin that it was hanging over. And strangely enough, it sure seemed like the vapor was responding to the music I was listening to. After observing it for a while, I was like, what's going on with this? This is crazy. I just saw a response on a pendulum, which has led me to this strange animated interaction of our physical reality with the emotional content of the music I was listening to. And as the music got more beautiful, the vapor pattern became more beautiful. And uh, it was just a wild correlation that I really could not believe my own eyeballs. I felt like it was at least worthy to give it a college try to see what was going on there. My whole goal, as described by a fellow named Victor Schauberger, is to comprehend and copy nature. Victor Schauberger, who everyone might remember as a, uh, the world famous naturalist who uh, asked us to look at nature. And uh, this is a, uh, uh, a man that inspired me, one of three men, uh, including uh, and primarily, firstly, it was uh, Francesco Piantelli, and then uh, secondly, uh, it was uh, the uh, uh, comments of uh, uh, Kenneth Shoulders that were really suggesting, you know, to look at nature, uh, don't tell it, it what it is, uh, um, you know, let it show you. This is basically what Francesco Piantelli said in 2015, January to myself and other MFMP members. And then there was the phrase by uh, Kenneth Shoulders where he says, uh, you know, if you don't look, you don't see, and it, 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 you don't even know what you didn't find, something along those lines. I'm paraphrasing that. Uh, and that's true. So it's, it's not like asking nature to tell you uh, rather than telling it what you are saying it's doing look to see what it is actually doing uh, and be open to that. Um, but also um, look in any way possible is the kind of message that I got from uh, the words of uh, uh, Kenneth Shoulders. Uh, many people out there have, I guess, in the past chosen not to look uh, because uh, uh, they think that what they're seeing isn't possible or that there isn't anything of interest. And uh, I think um, Alexander Shishkin has summed this up when he said that uh, people many years before were seeing what they thought was noise on uh, X-ray emulsions. Uh, but it turns out that they, that may have actually been strange radiation, these kind of little birdies. Uh, uh, and so they had missed this thing for so long because they didn't understand how those things could be there. So they just ignored it. So I felt like what I was looking at was something outside of the parameters of understood uh, academic explanation of our model for reality, worthy of a college try, of at least investigating this thing. I decided to give up the uh, fun of living out of a van. decided to move out here into the middle of nowhere and pursue this stuff.
And I wish that thing wouldn't broke down. I haven't been killing much of anything lately, but mosquitoes. People need to follow their intuition on these things and follow it through. You understand something that's so fundamental, or even barely understand, or just even get a concept that it exists, something that's so fundamental, but yet so completely cast aside by the academic community as to the nature of reality. I seem to be getting what I can only describe as a conscious, reacting, repulsing, anti-gravity vortex that would respond to either music or thought or speech. Please react. As Ralph says, it's the world soul communicating to us. But if it turned out that in fact it were exactly what the most persuaded school of rationalist explainers believes it is, namely whirlwinds uh -huh. of a particularly focused kind, uh -huh. you suddenly discover they're right. Suddenly whirlwinds can take on entirely new patterns of focus and write new patterns in the sort that there's a kind of spirit behind the whirlwind that really intent. expresses itself well, as, the, the as many traditions have always believed. The spiraling form of the whirlwind, a whirlwind is probably an extremely complex organized entity. It's an expression of DNA, it's an expression of the ordering morphology of the galaxy. I would expect it's a mystic, higher spiral, yeah. it's, yes, it's a higher yes. order form of life, yes. but it still has a spiraling energy form. Mm. Well, maybe um, some kind of breakthrough is not far away. What it, whatever's happening, it seems to have to do with positivity and love and cooperation. Utilization of crystal forms as a therapeutic agent. That is my purpose of being with you. I will share with you what I know now. I want to the best of my ability to cut away mysticism and replace mysticism with knowledge. With knowledge, then fear leaves and you can deal with what you are doing in a loving way.
this is a instrument to take the etheric forces, the etheric formative forces, bring them into a crystal, no, them, no different than light, and start the process of amplification of that energy with breath. <clears throat> no breath, stream of energy flowing out, and you see how the body, physical body, starts to react to it. It will sway, it will shift, because it's trying to adapt to that field. When the charge has gone from here and has saturated her body or his body, then that body becomes transparent and moves through, and I can feel with my left hand the charge. Then I start sensing when it is at a saturation level by moving up and down, up and down. I'm making and breaking the etheric body, amplifying that field now. As I do that, I synchronize my breath with the patients. So we become one in breath, one in etheric body, one in all of the subtle bodies. There's a total synchronization of being. What I've come to realize is that the principles of water memory are at play, as explored by Dr. Emoto in his uh, Messages from Water series. There seems to be some sort of a conscious imprint that you can put on water and shows up in his experiments as a, a different patterns, um, snowflakes, and uh, it's so, so touchy that even the person that's dropping the water samples onto the slides that's freezing affects the way that it freezes. It's different from person to person. So I wanted to observe this. I, it was hard to control the experiments. And now you can see I've got my smoke cells that I've been able to conduct my experiments in that can help. Let's take a look at what's going on with my giant stereo. And uh, whether or not the speakers are going, I can actually just put it on the headphones. This is one of the first controls. Is it, am I looking at a cymatic response? Or am I looking at something different? This crosses the objectivity subjectivity barrier that all of scientific method is predicated on that says that the observer and the observed have no bearing on each other.
we can look to this, you know, across the board, uh, the golden ratio, the Fibonacci pattern, all these sort of things are just lend back into the shape that I kept running across to my experiments. And in order to comprehend and copy nature, I was trying to apply these and extrapolate these forms into what I was seeing in nature. And it just almost takes an oversimplification of things to really stretch your mind far enough to say, that's what's going on with sunstorms. Um, we, we understand that heat and magnetism are at a certain strange interaction on the sun. We don't understand why and how exactly solar storms form. We've gotten some really pretty footage of them spiraling out in their vortices and uh, some computer models that were uh, 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 accumulated from sensors that could uh, sense uh, 10 million degree temperatures and things like that. One of its sensors, designed to record events at 10 million degrees, allowed scientists to peer into a tangle of rising arcs. By adding data from the Stereo A spacecraft, they were able to create a 3D picture of figure eight patterns in the rising arcs. This twisting configuration preceded the eruption, captured here by the SOHO spacecraft. And uh, when, I, when I took a look at what was going on with the NASA footage of the sunstorm formation, all I was seeing was a large fractal version of what I was observing in my experiments. So I was seeing this, all the precursories to a coronal mass ejection, uh, plasmatic rain, which was like a condensed ball of uh, energy that was a vortex vapor response from uh, music through a tourmaline crystal or other types of crystals. And I see the plasmatic rain phase. I see the strange things they call spicules, which are just like lightning-like apparitions that kind of come zinging across. And uh, I would see that lead into a precursory pattern. It's a very specific pattern. Now this figure eight pattern, it's not really a figure eight. It's more like an, uh, the, the core of the imploding vortex that I've been in, uh, witnessing, but it does kind of tend to spiral around and back through itself. During some of this time, I was doing some online experiments where I was trying to gather people, uh, people together online to take advantage of some of these psychic concepts that, that indicate a, a, an animistic view of the uh, universe through conscious response to these crystals that I've been working with. That was the intention of the group mass conscious experiments was to create a magic ticket through which we could change direction as a planet
And so I was taking pictures of this pendant that I made for this fellow. And through this hole, you could clearly see, like, coming out of this hole was this purple thing. And when I say purple thing, I mean it was a purple ball. And when you focus in on it, what you'll find is a giant universe of uh, strange happenings. This pattern, as you move it around on the lens, you can view it. And what I was looking at, I said, these look like phase waves from a physics experiment. And what you'll see is in motion, it's almost like looking like it in an MRI of a crystal's consciousness. You can look into the brain of the crystal more or less. Look into the ethereal energy form in motion on photograph that I was seeing projected out of the crystal with the vapor vortex experiments that also, when you look at it, it seems to be the exact same pattern that you will find in solar storms. And so this was my, this was the goal of the, uh, of the experiment was to create a magic ticket that would allow us as a species to be able to act like that school of fish or that flock of birds that can link up together in one conscious unit and see danger and just whoo, completely just go the other way. What they're doing is they're following these conscious fields that I'm observing in my experiments. And you can look at the pictures and the videos of the phase wave entity from the inside of the crystal and say, look, this is a conscious pattern. This is a fractal, some sort of a, a psychic link, some sort of a mechanism, some sort of an elusive field that is yet to be proven. One of the real interesting people that I came across that seemed to uh, have a lot of information about this would be Edgar Mitchell, who's uh, the fifth man to ever walk on the moon. In founding the Institute of Noetic Sciences, <clears throat> to have a mechanism by which we could address with new eyes and new science or new methodology the question of consciousness. What is it? How did it come to be? Why is it like it is? Because since for the last 400 years, since Rene Descartes with his famous pronouncement of the separation of mind and body, physicality and spirituality, science and the church have pr proceeded along their individual paths with a minimum of interaction with a tacit agreement to stay out of each other's backyard. <laughs> but quantum science, at the beginning of this century, has thrown those two backyards and torn down the fence between them. What I want to show you tonight <clears throat> is some work that I have been doing for the last few years, since the mid-90s, since The Way of the Explorer first came out, in quantum holography. <clears throat> and from my opinion, it is a powerful discovery, and I think you'll see why as we go through, that has the potential which I believe will be realized over the next decade or so. <clears throat> Buckminster Fuller, and you know who Bucky Fuller is, he coined the phrase Spaceship Earth back in the 60s, was uh, <clears throat> uh, credited with saying, we're the crew of Spaceship Earth and we're in mutiny. So he recognized the problems back then. I was privileged at one time to give a series of Buckminster Fuller lectures after his death. And uh, that was a high part, one of the high points of my lecture series, my lecture career. But he's accredited with the saying, if you want to understand the human condition, you must first understand the universe. But from the mystical point of view, and any great mystic will say, if you want to understand the universe, you must first understand the self. And what I've learned is that they're both right. Because from all the modern evidence, we seem to live in a universe that is self-organizing. 
intelligent, creative learning, interactive, participatory, evolving. And now we recognize it's a quantum system. So for uh, several decades, they've been investigating very similar conscious um, properties of this energy that seems to penetrate and spiral and, and create throughout uh, all of the universe. Something strange did happen in space. It was the opportunity to see the universe and see the world from a different perspective. They say travel broadens. <laughs> Getting on a, a mountaintop broadens, it gives you a different point of view. Well, being able to look at Earth from an ET perspective uh, was pretty wow. Let me tell you a little bit about it because it did get this whole thing started with me. It was the peak experience, the Eureka experience, uh, an epiphany that uh, made me realize I had to change the way I was thinking. And the unexpected happened. Looking at Earth like this, this tiny little blue ball, looking about twice the size that a full moon looks when you look at it from here. <clears throat> looking at the stars behind and being awestruck by all of this. I suddenly realized from my MIT training in star formation and galactic formation and so forth, <clears throat> The molecules of this body and the molecules of that spacecraft and my partners had been prototyped in an ancient generation of stars. Okay, well, that's the way it is. But all of a sudden, those were my molecules we were talking about. And it wasn't an intellectual exercise, it was just suddenly damn deeply personal. And <clears throat> it was a feeling experience, it wasn't an intellectual experience. And I suddenly realized that in a way we in science didn't understand, the universe was intelligent, interconnected, and that our modeling of answering the questions, who are we and how do we get here, was incomplete and flawed. <clears throat> and that from our cultural cosmologies, coming out of religion, they were archaic and flawed. And now as a spacefaring civilization, the beginning is a spacefaring civilization, we needed to have a new story about ourselves and a new answer to the question, who are we, how did we get here, and where we're going. What was interesting was that was accompanied by an ecstasy, a wow, an aha, a eureka. And the question to my linear left brain scientific mind was, okay, what kind of a mind brain is this that causes looking at the universe or looking at the world from different perspective have this sort of euphoric feeling. <clears throat> it wasn't until I got back, curious about this, left NASA a year or so later because it was obvious I wouldn't fly again until the shuttle and I didn't want to fly a desk for 10 years. So one of the first things I did was with some meager funds commissioned to research and we started digging through the ancient mystical literature because <clears throat> neurology and psychology had nothing to say about what was going on. But I needed to understand and thought maybe the mystical literature would help me understand something. And I discovered in digging through the literature <clears throat> that what had happened in space had a name in the ancient Sanskrit called the Salvakapa Samadhi experience, where you see things in their separateness, but you feel them in their connectedness. So if we move on to today, <laughs> I can point out some of the things that have been said about me as a result of being interested in this area and being associated with this sort of thing. And one of the first things... <clears throat> They used to say, 30 years ago, he got lost in space. And the second thing is, well, he's just a space cadet. <clears throat> and then some of them, uh, some of my colleagues who had worked with me for a while and still didn't quite know quite how to take me into how to take all of this stuff. Uh, something strange happened out there, but he's too bright to argue with. But he sure has a lot of a weird facts that he throws at you. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
Well, that one came along. And then when I came out with The Way of the Explorer here five years ago, Kirkus Reviews, although other people gave me good one, Kirkus Reviews said he's trying to reinvent the wheel. And we're starting to talk about how does science and mystical experience fit together. But then the crowning put down of all, which I'm sure many of us have experienced, is just another bunny hugger. <coughs> As things might get rough in the world, there's still a way to smile through it. And without that darkness, we wouldn't know what it is to uh, enjoy uh, our, ourselves. So as we see what spirit can be outside of ourselves, hopefully through this experiment, people can say, I can do that. I can follow my intuition. I can uh, follow my silly notions. We are connected to this one larger thing. There is a psychic element to the universe. Uh, I took a trip to North Carolina just on a coin toss and went out to the forest out there and had a nice, wonderful commune, a little time with nature, and uh, try to comprehend and copy nature. Ah, so here we are. A little bit more domesticated. Got everything back in order. And ready to do it all again tomorrow. Looks like it's gonna rain. So I got my umbrella and uh, some water in a cup instead of on my head. The moonshine is dry, saddest part of the day. And a uh, sweater. And uh, I don't know what else more a guy could ever need other than a sacred space to thoroughly and genuinely attempt to open myself up to the forest here. And uh, that's pretty much as, as, as far as you, anybody I believe has to do to open themselves up to these sort of uh, intuitions is just go out to the forest and ask for it. And if nothing happens, just enjoy yourself. So I wasn't really expecting anything but hoping something would happen. And uh, I seemed to get some intuitive information that would allow uh, a person to correlate their breathing with a response actually in nature to the wind. This 
listen in to my soul and serenity is what I find and it makes me calm That's a message I'd like known to all peoples around the world that the American Indian is a peaceful people and that we only want to live in brotherhood and peace with all the other people of the earth. And that uh, one thing that's been forgotten out there in that other world, as we call it, is a respect. And it should start with the Mother Earth. It should start with the plant life the animals, that we even have to make an offering before we take one for food. We get along here with the wild animals, the coyotes to the north of us. I have to go out and make agreement, talk with them, so that they will keep their agreements. They have a tribe and a family. And we have understanding with those animals. We have understanding with these plants that we take for medicine. And so, and, and losing these uh, values, they also lost a great deal in how to take care of this land. I like to teach about that. That's our job. We were delegated. We don't say we own the land. The grandfather Greek spirit, the one they call God, is the one that owns the land. And so that uh, we are, though, the caretakers of this land. Nobody else can do it. But there's people that can help, and we'd like a lot of people like that that would help. If we try to take your job, we'd make a mess of it, uh, somebody else's job. It wouldn't be too good, because you people have the technology, 
And we're all needed. All of us are needed to work together. And so there won't be any such day as next war of violence. Also that the land could bloom again. And it does in the desert where I live. And I can prove it right now. It looks like a jungle in the area right around my house. And, and it's green for 100 miles around. On every side, different deserts, real deserts. But in the area where we live, I've seen even what they call weeds. No such thing as a weed, really. I've seen them dance when there was no wind blowing to the sound of our drums and our singing. That's how powerful that is, too. And so that we have rain, and even without the rain, these plants are still green. It's amazing. And yes, I've been dancing as hard as I could, doing a few other things. So uh, it's my brother over there, that old storm god. And that's the way I got my name, for that matter. I used to scream like a little eagle is what they told me, even when I was a baby in diapers, <laughs> run right out in a storm. Yeah, I love it. And that lightning flash, there's a lot of power in it, I'll tell you. Mm -hmm. And I know some Indians, I don't like to talk too much about what I can do myself. I tell people I don't do nothing. That's a great spirit's power. But I do have a, a, a say-so sometimes, and I can request, you know, what. And if people deserve it, why, they can have it. It, 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 uh, we like to help, too, in our way of doing things. And that, I like to, uh, it's beautiful music when that thunder rolls. You can catch some of the water uh, right after the storm. Catch it in pots, pans, any way you can, and drink it. You don't need no, nothing to get high with. You don't need anything else. You can feel that energy go all the way through you. I do that sometimes and have my feathers out there making the thunder roll and bring the lightning down and, and then stand right there in the middle of it. I'd look around behind me. Here would be a lot of my family and my people there too looking up at the show, you know. I had many adventures at Metatante. The Grateful Dead bought the land for him, by the way. Oh. And he'd always wanted to have a healing center or a growth center where he could teach people how to practice Native American ways and nurse people back to help mm -hmm. the Native American herbs and ceremonies and sweat lodges and all of that. And one of my memorable experiences was going out late at night. One night he said, Stanley, come with me. I want to show you something. So I just went out late at night to the edge of his property where his property ended and the woods began and he become, became very vocal, hoot, 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 hoot. I would never be surprised at anything R.T. did. Yeah. Other people would think he's gone off his rocker. R.T. is what you called rolling thunder. Yes, thank you, R.T., rolling thunder. Out of the woods came a hoot, hoot, hoot. And within a few minutes, a pack of coyote came out of the woods. Oh. And the leader of the pack came right up to us, so close I could have reached out and patted his head, which I didn't, but I could have, mm -hmm. that close. And he and Rolling Thunder hooted back and forth for a few minutes. And then the coyote went back into the woods. And I said, R.P., what's that all about? He said, well, every so often we have to renew our pact. <laughs> We'll agree that we will not shoot and kill the coyotes. They agree that they won't raid our chicken coops. <laughs> and for all those 10 years that Metatante existed, there was no coyote raid against the chicken coop, which was the main reason why farmers in the area killed coyote, because the coyotes were notorious for eating chicken. Well, what you're getting at here is this uncanny relationship Rolling Thunder had with nature itself. Yes, right. And, and I had some experience of that because when I interviewed him many years ago in the San Francisco Bay Area, which uh, for people who live there, uh, they will know it rains in San Francisco, but we 
almost never ever see lightning in in that area mm -hmm. but the day that rolling thunder arrived for our interview we had a thunderstorm and there was lightning all night long which has never happened in my memory any other time very typical i've heard that report also he had uh, <clears throat> this uncanny ability to interact with nature. Yeah. Now, Native Americans don't go into the cause and effect paradigm that Westerners do. They look at interaction effects. So I'm not saying rolling thunder caused the lightning and thunder, but there was an interaction there that I've heard many, many times where he was present and upon his arrival, there would be lightning and thunder. Well, I, I also interviewed Doug Boyd, who wrote a book mm -hmm. about rolling thunder. Doug Boyd, as I recall, was the adopted son of Elmer Green, mm -hmm. the uh, well-known uh, physiological psychologist, mm -hmm. uh, one of the pioneers of biofeedback. That's right. And as I recall, Doug Boyd, in his interactions with rolling thunder, witnessed something very strange where Rolling Thunder found some bugs, I think they were June bugs, out in the desert, and he would take a little twig and tickle the June bugs, and he said, that's what caused the lightning <laughs> to strike. Ah, and, ah. And, and, and Doug Boyd witnessed it. He'd be tickling the, the, the June bugs, and there'd be thunder and lightning as a result. How about that? And when I actually came into this agreement with nature, an equilibrium with breathing and moving, there did seem to be a correlation. And when I took this uh, breathing technique back into the experiments, when I got back home into the case, it seemed as though you're able to use this breathing and body movement to be able to manipulate the actual vortex inside of the case. Really open-minded artist friend of mine that's been supportive of these experiments all along and uh, really fed a lot of positive energy into my silly notions and uh, came down We made some videos of this phenomenon using the breathing to control what's going on inside the vortex. So we had actually a setup in which we used a turtle shell and a crystal. And by spinning these into each other, you can feel this repelling force building up. But if you get just the right amount of energy spun into the turtle shell with the crystal, you can get this really nice suspended vortex that you can start taking control of with your breathing. By inhaling and taking advantage of the principles of water memory, I inhale with love. And love for kitties, love for flowers, love for all your friends and family and every positive thing that makes you just love life. You breathe that in and you exhale with thanks. Thanks for all of the adversity, all of the bad things, all of the things that have caused you harm, all the things that have caused you problems. You exhale. Thank you for those adversities because they help you realize how good the positive stuff is. Where do you go when you dream at night? Are you up there? And when
clouds Always there Up so far In the sky And breeze Floating gently by Please take me now Into the night Into the night When we look at the way that this is affecting um, the vapor, the vapor is just using the principles of water memory and a conscious imprint with the intention of having fun and expressing itself and setting up the, the proper conditions for not only a human being or a conscious or breathing, breathing creature, but a non-breathing object like a crystal or a rock. Well, the mantra for this whole experience has been to comprehend and copy nature. And uh, when I see something over and over and over again, no matter how uninterconnected they seem, there's a form. And there's a, a form that seems to be pulling all these things together that goes beyond the physical into the conscious. Hopefully this will kind of help people feel like it's not a waste of time. It's not a waste of energy to entertain these notions. Because if what we need is solutions that are outside of the box, well, we do need to start thinking in completely different paradigms. You know, whether they're, all entities have a kind of biological or physical base, be it a star, or a species of animals or plants, a kind of crystal or whatever. So that everything at one point passes through matter, and that passage through matter allows the eternal existence of the form in this other realm after the matter has dissolved from the form and then somehow biological existence is fraught with these intimations of immortality Be who knows why i mean we just pick up on our own destiny as it were and it lies in this animate but disincarnate realm yes John Hutchison is a Canadian experimenter that's self-taught and his original intention was to pursue some of Tesla's wireless transfer of energy technology just finish where Tesla left off and uh, what ended up happening has been come to be classified as the Hutchison effect. In the late 70s, like around 1979, he started making uh, the news for anti-gravity experiments and replication of Tesla lab stuff. So what he was doing was he was using uh, super high voltage and super high frequency on a bunch of homemade equipment in combination with naval salvaged gear, very ingenious setup uh, to be able to uh, 
hopefully replicate some of these strange effects that Tesla claimed. And what ended up happening was a different set of effects, including anti-gravity, transmutation of metals, uh, spaghetti style, uh, just ripping metals apart, um, strange things that have yet to be explained. saying that this probably is a favorite device of John's uh, and he may recognize it because he's got all these wonderful handles all over it just makes it look extra cool um, but essentially it's a, a receiver and uh, uh, I was told that John would listen on to some earphones and uh, that he would have an idea of when effects might have been occurring uh, when he heard some things going on in the earphones. He was selling metal samples on eBay from his experiments. And when I very first saw these, I didn't have a clue. And so when I started looking into the, some of these listings and some, go to the, some of these video clips, I realized this was actually indeed John Hutchison and recognized his voice. So wow, this is, this is actually that guy. This is the guy I remember from the, the videos, the anti-gravity stuff. And uh, he's selling stuff off, trying to build a lab with the profits. So cool, you know, I'll, I'll buy a couple from him. I'm, I'm in. And just kind of started talking to him. And that's just more or less how it started. I just, he's just a great, great person to get in contact with. The type of resonance which causes the Hutchinson effect and related effects can be explained by looking at how the frequencies compare to the molecular and atomic structure of the material itself. This phenomenon is only observed while using ultra high frequency and incredibly high frequency tesla waves. Why? Because they correspond to the frequency of the distance in the atoms in the structure. The distance between the atoms in a structure is equal to the wavelength, which will resonate that structure. Once you find the resonant frequency with the Tesla waves, you have effectively trapped and aligned the atoms. You can now tune the frequency a tiny bit higher, causing diamagnetism by squeezing the atoms together, restricting the electron orbits, which causes a north pole and a south pole artificially induced diamagnetism which causes levitation. If you lower the frequency it pulls the atoms apart a tiny bit which causes a phase change of matter where a solid starts behaving like a liquid due to these strong electromagnetic forces resonating within it. This is the force that pulls aluminum bars apart and turns them into rubber spaghetti. This is the force that levitates 70 pound cannonballs 
its electromagnetic force. Many strange transmutations. This one started off as copper and ended up as brass. And uh, you can still see little spots of copper in it here and there. It looks like a very strong force was kind of ripping and pulling it upwards as it changed to a some type of a molten state. These very strange things to be happening on, on what started off as copper. So what we did here was we assumed that these two pieces here might be in the same soliton loop. They looked a similar shape, uh, although this one does seem to have a very large crystal in it. I wish I could get an SEM of that at this time. But anyway, so we wanted to see if these two affected areas uh, had a similar um, distribution of elements. And lo and behold, uh, it's a pretty damn close match. Yes, there's a little bit more copper in the second sample. The iron and copper ratio is switched around, but uh, pretty much every peak is, is spot on. And uh, you'll note that the aluminium is very low by comparison. And, uh, I think we've got a table of the previous one here. Um, so you have, uh, uh, I think that might be it. Last result, oh sorry. Recent result, 18% on the iron, 15.5% on the, 15.6% uh, on the copper, and zinc is 6 point, or nearly 7%. And iron, copper, and zinc, 18.8, 15.6, and nearly 7% on the zinc. Uh, they're pretty much spot on. Uh, that's that's really made me happy. <laughs> so the theory is that the ions fuse to iron, uh, the aluminium atoms fuse to iron, standard George Joshua type reaction. And then the copper is some sort of oxygen that's fused into the iron, and the zinc is water from moisture in the air that gets fused onto the copper. The sulfur is two oxygen atoms being fused to sulfur. Uh, the lead is just at the end of the reaction chain because you get a whole bunch of uh, stuff being shoved together. And uh, I, I haven't got a ready explanation for the rest of it, but uh, um, that's really satisfying. Transmutation. Finally, 2017, we had some interesting results, but we weren't in a place to talk about it with confidence. Today we are. So this is before. This is during our plasma discharge. What's interesting about this is that the plasma double layers have collapsed down and become very intense around the anode, and now it's giving a uniform coronal glow. Keep this in mind as we go through this presentation. And this is after. And we said, well, that's interesting. <laughs> we had other words. So we decided it was time to subject it to what's called scanning electron microscopy and EDACs. They kind of go hand in hand. Technology's been around for 30 years, and scanning electron microscopy is just a very powerful microscope. EDACs basically is technology where they energize the elements that are on the sample 
and they can tell you definitively what those elements are. And they use it for forensic sciences, all kinds of things. And it's a standard piece of equipment. It's about a million bucks for one. I wouldn't say it's standard or common, but it's very good. So this is June and another lab that we work with and what we did with the sample. So when you go over a sample like this on a scanning electron on a microscope, it's almost like scanning over top of a planetary surface. So just imagine that you're in a satellite or a rocket and you're saying, well, that's interesting. So pretend you're in there, you're zooming in with the microscope. Things get interesting. And then we said, what are you doing there? <laughs> a ball. And then you can get into all kinds of discussions about how a sphere can form in an experiment like this. And there's a lot of people that agree that to get a sphere like this has to form in a non-gravitational environment. So if you want to make spheres, you throw particles up that are heated. And as they glide through the atmosphere, they become spherical. We don't know what it was. We didn't know why it was there. There's better pictures of this, but just take a look at some. There's some almost like tectonic thing happening here. We can't tell you some of, the, some of the things that we did to get there, but we can show you the results. So if you see some of the elements missing, that's some of the elements that we, we can't discuss. But what's interesting is these elements that you see were not in the chamber before. And sapphire is making lanthanum, and it's making cerium. And it's making carbon, and it's making oxygen. So we went and scanned another region. He said, well, that's interesting. That doesn't look like the base materials at all. And this is what we found. We found phosphorus and silicon and titanium and oxygen and magnesium and calcium and sodium and potassium and aluminum and carbon and chlorine and sulfur. Those were also not, and we know definitively they were not in there. What you see here in the previous slide is that these formations are actually growing out of the surface. It's growing. That's what they look like. This, this looks like actually a fish egg sac full of particles and things. So he said, well, nobody's going to believe us because, well, we're the Sapphire team, and of course, we're completely biased. That's how they're going to see it. So he said, this particular agency said, we have a lab for you if you want to validate your results and send it down to this lab. And it's a lab that they use and Lockheed uses and others. And we said, okay, we want you to go and scan the sample and tell us what you find. And this is what they found. And I thought, wow, that's a really interesting ball into what is going on there. It's like these particles forming in here. And they confirmed the fact that the predominant elements of that ball are cerium and lanthanum. These are heavy elements. Really do volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. So I am looking at the Hutchison sample fracture, and uh, it's actually a lot more bizarre than I thought it was <laughs> when looking at it under the optical microscope. It's like these pouches of what are essentially predominantly aluminium, uh, and it has these little nipples on them, uh, which you can see here, like it's got some sort of cancer, uh, and. Uh, if we scroll around this, let's see if I can do this and want to change hands, uh, you will see that this extends quite a way. It's got, I've kind of got these stretch, stretch marks and these sort of mounds. Now it has these uh, sort of stripes um, and uh, they are some really odd elements going on. There's a quick look at part of the Hutchison fracture sample. So the balls seem to have these kind of stretch marks between them. So I focused in on one of the stretch marks you can see here. 
Bearing in mind that this is supposed to have started off with a single lump of aluminium. And what I've done here is I've gone along the uh, strand uh, to see what's going on. And it would appear that as you go down the strand, you have like carbon, oxygen, magnesium, aluminium, and then carbon goes down, oxygen is about the same, magnesium is about the same, but aluminium goes up. And then there's a bit of iron, and then there's more iron, and then there's a little bit less iron. Um, uh, but then there's silver, so that's uh, quite fascinating. Okay, and this looks like it's got different elements in it, which is quite bizarre. So this is pretty crazy, actually. Uh, this strandy thing here, um, it uh, looks like it's uh, got kind of carbon fibers here, the white stuff, but it's actually a mix between carbon and uh, magnesium. And in fact, there is magnesium blotches all over the surface of the aluminium. Uh, very interesting, blotches, 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 fairly evenly spaced, and um, they could be the blotches we saw earlier. And if I turn on the iron here, sorry, here, you can see there's a, a block here, which is represented here, but it kind of must go behind this structure, which is over the top of it. But you can see that the iron is refracting through this. So this is like a, a clear crystal fiber. And well, it appears to be made of carbon and uh, magnesium. So many weird phenomenon going on with it. This started off as a piece of copper. It was a bar of copper. And uh, what you see inside of here, that little light spot, is interesting. It is actually wood. And so that's another strange observation of the Hutchison effect, is these weird uh, metal transformations uh, without heat. Uh, up to uh, a glowing white metal sample that doesn't burn paper and you can grab. turned into a strange amalgamation of alloys that tend to oxidize at uneven rates and gemify. So there is some sort of a sheer force Just pull it out of the uh, test area over there and put some paper on the hall in the hallway here. This used to be the <laughs> used to be oh my mercy seven long, just under two inch by two inch solid block of iron. And this is a small sample that just sort of did some strange stuff, but not as impressive as this thing. I'll try and turn around to get the best light on it here. It's a bit heavy. I'll do a rotary thing here. It's still flaking off pieces of it here. 
small bits are all over the place. Seems to be the outer shell. Now the different unique kind of ways this happened. There was a lot of smoke by the way, but no, the actual sample was cold. I'm not sure if the smoke was like a dust formation coming off of it or what. weird things happening that shouldn't be happening like these are aluminum now when you roll these into each other it's a very strange sensation that most people without any stretch of the imagination go huh because it feels like almost kind of like a weak magnetic force repelling each other apart but these are aluminum it's completely non-magnetic and when you uh stop spinning them they seem to phase down they seem to actually have some sort of a liquidy filled core sort of feeling to them to where it's just weird. So as it tapers down, that torsional resonant um, mechanical fr uh, forces going into that, you can see it pulsing around like a jello mold and it's hard glass. You can almost kind of see the reverberations springing back and forth through at points. Weird, they kind of yank and pull on each other a little bit. So glass is actually not a solid, it's a slow moving liquid and through this, we have a strange transfer. We give optimal conditions. We put it on a resonant plate, give it a little bit of input. And there, the, uh, the lens in the middle is moving and the aluminum is moving, but the rest of this stuff's not. All right, so here's another little video of this uh, situation with this glass and the center glass is gonna move. These other three are not. None of them are fixed. All of them are rolly. They're all glass. These are Hutchison Effect metal samples. These are aluminum that were forced apart with radio waves and there's some sort of a strange transfer of resonance happening when you get motion going on between in a field. They can somehow or another affect this center object, but not these other objects. And so, we've got a magnet. Let me show you it's a magnet. And uh, it's not gonna do anything. Because it's a magnet, and these are aluminum. And aluminum is paramagnetic, but it's not gonna be anything going on here so no magnetism
when I'm holding these particular samples in my fingers, this is just filling it out. This is a pattern that I call the energetic Rubik's Cube. There's a certain pattern, these lock together energetically. They start kind of pulling and yanking on each other. When I, in the right hand with the steel and the left hand with the aluminum, the aluminum's going in uh, vertical clockwise fashion and then this is going in horizontal clockwise fashion and they have to be facing each other correctly. So it has to be facing each other like this and as they turn, they have to go corresponding quarter turn at a time or else it doesn't work. Weird. I don't know why. It's just what's going on. So I call that the energetic Rubik's Cube. And when I do this energetic Rubik's Cube for a little bit, what it starts to do is kind of build this kind of feeling in my fingertips. It's not imagination. This is a physical feeling. And what it feels like is this one starts to actually go around an invisible axis kind of on this node and uh, coming out of like energy out of this split and it starts to build and kind of climb an invisible ladder in my hand. I can feel it losing weight in my fingertips and it seems like there's a force pulling upwards. Well, I mean, I, I tinkered with that for like a couple months and I, I told John, I said, this is really weird. Um, I can actually hold them apart and still feel them like really far apart and uh, it seems like they're still yanking on each other. So something really weird and outside of normal physics is going on. And so when I actually put it on a scale, the real interesting results started to come in. That feeling that I got in my fingertips was actually real. I was able to measure it on a scale and the static weight of these objects will change. All right, so I'm gonna do a, another video here on the uh, quartz shifting weight with this Hutchison effect metal sample and uh, trying to get it totally centered out here on the scale uh, not quite there we go somewhere around there and uh, I've marked these so we can put them back in the exact same place on the plate so we'll be shifting in weight because of that and uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to physically manipulate the quartz and there's some strange anomalous uh, residual anti-gravity properties apparently still lingering and uh, what it's going to do is it's going to change the static weight by a small but measurable amount so scale works just fine it's uh, not hanging up or rigged or anything like that and uh, it's, it's just normal scale. So what I'm going to do now is I can feel this in my hand. When it starts to pull upwards, I know that it's starting to activate.
So, you got a small difference in the weight. Actually, I need to kind of get it lined up this way to get it to lose the, the most weight, believe it or not. I can feel it vectoring upwards. Just pull it. And this force can be measured on a scale, and this is non-magnetic stainless. I know that there's a property of quartz to repel against high-powered magnets. And uh, that is true, but that's definitely not what's happening here. It's now magnetic stainless. So we got a pretty, pretty decent weight drop original static weight of 563.15 it's been changed a couple tenths rebalance it out and it looks like we lost about uh, slightly over three tenths of a gram. So I'm recentered again, re zeroed out with our new static weight and our crystals uh, back in the same spot. All the weight is where it was when the original measurement was taken. So nothing like that has changed. And uh, now we're re zeroed. What I'm going to do is another manipulation that is going to, strangely enough, add the weight back that we just lost. So by uh, spinning, spinning it uh, laterally, <clears throat> it will regain the weight. And, uh, spinning it vertically, it will lose the weight. So we've got back to our original static weight here. accurate you know for for this purpose I mean it's a cheap scale but it, it shows the point that I'm getting at here
I'm going to talk about something which I've not disclosed before, and it's a concept that I have from understanding what about Evos uh, and uh, how they can scale to any level. So I've talked about this, that they can scale to any level. Uh, and essentially what I'm saying is this. When material is either captured as energy, raw energy from the ether, or it's captured as matter, and it's condensed into an exotic vacuum object, and you have billions and trillions of atoms in there, it strips off the electrons. And what you do is you get the nuclei of the atom in there, and the electrons are shed. Some of their energy is converted into soft X-rays or, or UV light, or the actual electrons are spat out into the wider environment. When the confining field, which can end up just being one, a charge of minus one, i.e. basically it's almost every electron that was ever involved, and the charge and inertia and the mass it, it is shielded from the protons, when the thing that is shielding that decays, what do you have? You have a massive blob of nucleons, which is highly, highly positive, because all of the electrons were shed out, right? And then the environment around it has all of the electrons from that matter. So what do you end up with? You have a thing that has resonant blobs of much smaller quantity that have different uh, uh, elemental makeups like you have in your solar system. And in the center, the majority of is what was uh, confined into the center. This is a solar system builder. You build up an Evo in, in space, you charge it with energy from the ether, you charge it with the matter that it can capture, the electrons are spat out, and then you trigger its decay and it goes and it sprays down the solar system, and the resonance of that produces bodies that have different elemental constitution, and the central body is massively positive. And all of the electrons that were synthesized or captured or, or charge separated during that process are out there in the cosmos. They were spat out, and this positive body then starts sucking it back in. It starts sucking it back in, and you get the electric sun model. And okay. so that, that is that is my concept. been breathing love and thanks into this object and what it's going to do is it's going to slow down and is right before it turns back the other way it's going to get an extra two so I'll, I'll point that out so that's the first extra one the second extra one and now it's going to turn around It's going to go one up. Won't do it. See, I'm sitting here talking about it instead of participating in it. So, <sighs> breathing love and thanks. And I'm going to look at this thing and focus my attention on it this time. Just encourage it. Just nothing more than you can do it. Let's go, buddy, go. Woo! It's like a car trying to make it over a tall hill. You know you've all said that. little engine that could so now it's going to get two more and turn around don't oh, made three more I'm not trying to tell you what to do maybe I miscalculated that spot there it was go buddy go do it Go, 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 go. All right, let's do it again. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. Go, 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 go. 
Go, 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 go. All right, let's do it again. You can do it, you can do it, you can do it. Go, 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 go. Ah, you get down. Woo. Go, go, go. Go. Oh. See? People feel if they can't find an explanation, they feel very, very insecure. Why? Because they haven't been able to straighten things out. The world is not that way. So the truth, in other words, what is going on, is of course a lot of wiggles. But uh, the way it is, is always in relation to the way you are. In other words, however hard I hit a skinless drum, it will make no noise. Because noise is a relationship between a fist and a skin. So in exactly the same way, light is a relationship between electrical energy and eyeballs. It is you, in other words, who evoke the world. And you evoke the world in accordance with what kind of a you you are. What kind of an organism? One organism evokes one world, another organism evokes another world. And so everything, reality is, is, is a kind of relationship. So once one gets rid of the idea of the truth as some way the world is in a fixed sense, say it is that way, see? Then you get to another idea of the truth altogether. The idea, the truth that cannot be stated, the truth that cannot be pinned down. And then that is the kind of truth that is God. When we speak of God as the uh, reality that exceeds all thoughts, that surpasses all definitions, that is infinite, unbounded, eternal, immeasurable in terms of time. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about gases vertebrae or a huge, uh, vast void without any wiggles in it. All gas. Put it another way altogether. The truth that cannot be.